I think we are at a point in time where, yes, societies are having to find a floor. This is hateful and this is not because Silicon Valley sure as hell isn't going to do it. What's going on with artificial intelligence? News publishers, bloggers, public relations firms, law firms. Do you not think this is going to be a tipping point? Anybody who is particularly at risk of producing defamatory text. Run that by me again. Google, Facebook, Twitter and others. We're getting into Star Trek replicator stuff here. The noose is tightening in regard to this stuff. I'll tell you one of the things that bakes my noodle about all of this. Hello and you're welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Weckler, in association with Square. Square helps you look after your business needs from payments to menu management and online ordering. Visit square.com for more. Now, what's going on with artificial intelligence systems? This week, OpenAI unveiled ChatGPT4, the latest version of the AI system that powers ChatGPT. It can process up to 25,000 words, eight times more than before, but it can also respond to images, providing recipe suggestions from photos of ingredients, for example, as well as captions. Neil Brady, co-founder of Irish AI platform Calibre AI, what does this all mean for us and, and what can GPT-4 do potentially? I suppose we're, we're still sort of in the early stages of trying to figure that out. Um, it, it goes without saying that it's going to be disruptive and, I mean, it's multimodal, so the capacities and functions uh, between text, video and audio and all of that are, are definitely going to increase. Um, I think it probably, the thing that sort of strikes me most about it, though, is that it is going to compound the existing uh, deficiencies with the technology. It's also going to, it's, it's still susceptible from what we've seen so far to misinformation, um, mm. Factual inaccuracies. Well, that we'll come to that. But during the demo, for example, one of the demonstrators inputted a hand-drawn sketch of a website, and the system came back with a functioning, working website. I mean, we're we're getting into Star Trek replicator stuff here. Yeah, yeah, we we are. No, it is absolutely, and I think I think it is going to lead to uh, increased productivities and efficiencies in that realm, but. Again, going back to the, the sort of deficiency side of things, a very good piece in the Washington Post by Will Ormus. I think it's this morning or yesterday in which he talks about, say, Copilot, another uh, variant of ChatGPT, which codes um, a lot of the, it's putting out all this code and it's very efficient in lots of ways. But a lot of the code actually also doesn't work. Uh, similarly, a lot of the and links. And that's true for GPT-4. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's up to if if that's the case GTP4 GPT4 but I think so. I think it's still going to be er, it's very early it's only the last 24 hours or so that it's it's really sort of committed to the public consciousness yeah. but I think I think people are seeing the same kinds of problems. One of the things we all focused on with ChatGPT and GPT3 was essays at school. You just uh, you gave it a prompt. You asked it a question, one or two sentences and it came back to you with a very competent 1500 word essay maybe on the history of a famous Irish figure from the early 20th century, for example. Um, this can take a prompt of up to 25,000 words, a full-scale novella, as well as images. Um, do you not think this is going to be a tipping point? I mean, for essays, for example. Are original essays just finished? Uh, yeah, I, know, I mean, it's, uh, I think it is a tipping point. I, I, I think that generative AI is here to stay. Um, I don't know is the honest answer if ChatGPT is uh, it, it, and and that specific kind of disruption that you're that you're mentioning there. Like inter the International Baccalaureate has announced that it's accepting essays written with ChatGPT, but there are lots of Sorry, other. Run that by me again. The French Baccalaureat, uh, which yeah. is a secondary school exam equivalent to our Leaving Cert or maybe our Junior Cert. Yeah, it is saying it will accept essays. I think it's ChatGPT. It'll, it'll accept the use. Yes, it'll, it'll permit the use of ChatGPT in the generation and GPT-based technology in the generation of essays. Um, but there are other factors, I think, that will. It's like there's going to be a very complex interplay. Like, for example, it's an open question as to whether Google and other search engines are going to low, low downrank AI-generated content. Oh, but that'd be a competitive issue, would it? Or would that be a, qual a content quality issue? I, I suppose it'd be a bit of both. Mm. It'd be a, a bit of both. But I mean, I guess the question we're asking here is to what extent 
generative content is going to increasingly disseminate and be taken up. I tell you one of the things that bakes my noodle about all of this is whether it's all going to become a loop. So let's yeah. say we all start using ChatGPT or GPT-4 and we start sourcing content and publishing that ourselves. And let's say like the baccalaureate, it becomes acceptable. At some point, an increasing percentage of all of the content out there will be published and created by ChatGPT, which means where's the original content? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the data uh, that that uh, these systems are trained on is a really, really important point. Um, and, that, and that kind of feedback loop is one dimension of it. Um, I honestly don't know exactly how that that is going to play out, but um, it, it does it does run the risk of sort of feeding off itself. Yeah, now I can see in Ireland uh, there are a couple of companies here already jumping on it. Intercom, which is after Stripe, arguably our biggest uh, unicorn uh, tech company, they've yep. already released a product iterating on GPT four, which is uh, an iteration on their chatbot uh, products. I've seen a couple of uh, others as well um it's not just this that's happening though google for example has put out an uh, an ai update that allows you to generate an entire document or an entire email uh, from a single prompt what about you guys at caliber ai do, do, is there any scope for you to use uh, chat gpt or yeah, gpt4 we're looking at it we are we are definitely it's it's on our radar uh, we are trying to we're ex we're examining the use cases um generally speaking our our what we do at caliber is quite different in in some ways i mean we we classify text as opposed to to generate text now the you could argue that we're in the generative space because the way in which we present our classifications or information is it's it's generated. So just just to remind listeners what and viewers what do you you exactly do? You look for things like defamation, for example. Yeah, so we we basically build language classifiers. So we we classify, detect, uh, flag speech that is what I would call problematic uh, across multiple different categories. So the, the principal technology that we built over the last two years is a defamation classifier. So this is a, a custom built piece of technology uh, powered by a unique data set, um, which will scan and detect and flag to the user when they are, or the machine, when it is uh, they or it are outputting text that is likely to give rise to a defamation claim. It's likely to meet the linguistic criteria of being defamatory. But we also classify for other categories of speech, so harmful text as well in the general sense, racist, anti-Semitic, LGBT. So typically who might use this service? Anybody with a keyboard, but as the liability... But a company, an organization, institution... News publishers, bloggers, um, public relations firms, law firms, uh, anybody who is particularly at risk of producing defamatory text or of being uh, subject to a claim for defamation. And uh, obviously, as the liability regime continues to evolve for Internet publishers, we see social media platforms, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter and others who for whom the, the noose is tightening in regard to this stuff as being very much uh, part of our, our so users. So you're effectively automating or adding AI to functions that content moderators might have done or even lawyers yep. here at a newspaper, for example. Yep. We would have lawyers who would look through copy to, to do exactly that. Yep, exactly, exactly. It's, a, it's an extra set of eyes. It's the equivalent of the whole idea from the, the beginning was like an AI editor. Um, you know, we all know news publishers in particular have seen the business model uh, erode and the resources that they have uh, alongside that over the last 20 years. Uh, so the whole idea here is a, a best in class uh, artificial editor or approximation of an editor, but one that is built with those editors in mind by editors to augment their work and to, to act as that extra set of eyes for them. Mm, OK, um, tell me a little bit about why you created this or how you you got into this uh, business. I suppose, well, it started, it was, it's my, as you probably know, my co-founder is my, my father, Connor, who was the editor of the Irish Times for many years and a, a well-known journalist. And um, I've worked most of my life as a mixture of sort of a, a freelance journalist. I worked at the Sunday Tribune for a time, The Guardian for a while. I worked at Storyful. Um, and it, it really came out of the events of 2016. Uh, at that time, I was working in a, a think tank called the Institute of International and European Affairs, running their digital policy uh, program there. And in 2016, as you'll recall, we saw a seismic political shift 
which we're still undergoing, the rise of populism, the vote for Brexit, the vote for, for Donald Trump. And um, it led to a conversation between Connor and I as to what role traditional media uh, and digital uh, media, social media, had played in facilitating this this big political shift in, in the way that media facilitates the conversation. And we sort of concluded that it was it was kind of broken and, um, you know, sort of the the... the the conflict and hate speech and confrontation and, and miscommunication that we that is, is is an established part of the public discourse was a huge part of the problem. And so that was kind of the motivating factor. It's never an uncontroversial area because when you start talking about this topic, you actually in, inevitably get into clashing political views and issues of freedom of speech and where you draw the line. Is it that you try to uh, conform or code or solve for what regulations there are there, European regulations, US regulation, for example. Is that how you approach this? Or do you come at it also with a, you know, a best case uh, model, uh, ethically or morally, in terms of what your own view might be? I think it's a combination of things. So we we have our own views and we have an advisory panel um, of people who are are expert in this whole area of, of what are the permissible limits of public discourse? So Alan Rusbridger, former Guardian editor, Facebook Oversight Board member, he's on there. Um, and these are people we sort of talk to to sort of try and, and define these standards of what is and is not permissible speech. But yes, at the same time, as we developed our technology, we paid extremely close attention to European legislative developments, the Digital Services Act, uh, the kind of algorithmic auditing that we're seeing coming out of that. Um, so obviously, you know, we built an algorithm essentially from the ground up, a custom algorithm. So we've been very careful to inspect it for bias, uh, uh, gender bias, that kind of thing as, as we build it to make sure that da the data set is balanced. Um, and then at the same time, paying attention to domestic legislation, like here we have the, the OSM war bill. Uh, there's a hate speech act uh, bill, which is, is recently it's either been brought in or is about to be brought in. Um, in the United States, similarly, you, you have Section 230, which has just come before the Supreme Court where this this very issue is being decided. So I think we are at a point in time where, yes, societies are having to sort of try and f having to try and find a floor and to 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 say to the citizenry, look, this is hateful and this is not mm -hmm. uh, that that's where it's going to got to, you know, because Silicon Valley sure as hell isn't going to do it. Yeah. Have you been on Twitter lately? <laughs> um, because, uh, again, coming back to this idea of how of norms and how you solve for that and how you code for that or how ad adapt algorithms for that. This must be a particularly interesting time for a company like yours. And we thought that things were going in one direction, then Elon Musk takes over Twitter. Yeah. It seems to be rowing back on, uh, on things from what we hear this week, for example. Um, he has uh, cut the content moderation team there. Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, it's it's uh, it is hard to know exactly where it's going to go. Um, you, you mentioned Might there. They, could they be a customer? That would be a good pitch to Twitter. Twitter, yeah. I mean, we'd love to work with them. Uh, you know, we, we we absolutely we think that there's a lot that we can do there. I mean, this the going back to the sort of the original vision for this technology being a, a kind of a, an AI editor on your shoulder to augment the work of of, of whoever that sort of the text manager is. Um, Twitter, you know, is into sort of nudge tech. It's, it's built a lot of that nudging kind of technology into a system. So we think there's a lot that we can do there. Um, I mean, you mentioned there about, I think you said something about standards in code. Mm. Um, there was a very interesting quote uh, a couple of weeks ago in Wired. Um, Google recently appointed its first vice president for, I think the title is Society and Technology, a guy called James Manyika, and he... Um, He's formerly at McKinsey's, and he's very involved in, in a lot of the, the oversight of what's happening with BARD, Google's uh, botanist language models and that. And he, refer, he mentioned about that, that was the phrase he used. He said, we have to find a way to sort of get these speech standards into code. And that is exactly what we've been trying to do for, from day one. Mm. So taking a step back, you've co-founder with your dad of Calibre AI. What's the climate like at the moment trying to run a startup? It's tough. <laughs> it's, it's a tough time, you know, between one thing and another. As I said to, to Paul, my, my uh, CTO on the Slack the other day, we've had plague, war, uh, 
inflation, the implosion, partial implosion of the tech sector, now the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. So it's 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 it is very tough. At the same time, I think we're as a company we're we're lucky because we are in a space, as you say, that is it's very live at the moment. These are very live, not just technological issues, but societal issues. As I said, the Supreme Court looking at Section 230, I mean, already there, there was a, an observation but made by one of the, the judges uh, during the hearing that they there's no way that they think that sh- those kind of liability protections will apply to generative text mm. in the same way as it does to human generated text. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 a challenging time, um, but it's an exciting time. It sounds like a cliche, but that is the way were, it is. You weren't with Silicon Valley Bank, were you? No, thank God, no. <laughs> Quite, some Irish companies were. Yeah, I've 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 seen. Yeah, there's. Uh, I haven't heard any any particular names, but yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's, it's oh, Owen McCabe from Intercom was tweeting the other day saying they had 22 million dollars uh, with Silicon Valley Bank, and he said the majority of their capital wasn't, and they were okay, and they'd be okay anyway because of what the U.S. government did in terms of depositors. Yeah, but that must have absolute, fr- absolutely freaked out startups across the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've no, I've no doubt. I've no doubt. Um, and uh, I do think also, just as, as you mentioned, I think there is a, it, it is also a, quite a striking episode, particularly for the tech sector, because and I, I've seen a couple of columnists, there was a piece at the FT the other day, somebody was making this point that, you know, Silicon Valley and the tech sector are s- so often kicked back so hard against regulation mm. and the state and attempts to try and manage the 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 problems that the move fast and break things ideology which is coming back in with everything that's happening with, with the generative ai stuff um and uh i think you, a little bit of humble pie and appreciation of the fact that the state is, is paling the out wouldn't go astray yeah there was, I, we did a podcast on this recently i would just des- describe it as a teachable moment for a lot of libertarian tech bros who might have had a view about the banking system and how old-fashioned it was and how bailouts were you know, for you know, yesterday's generation until it happens to them. Yep. And then it is uh, something to be desired. Neil, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for coming in to us to talk uh, about uh, artificial intelligence and GPT-4 and your own company, Calibre AI, and the very best of luck with all of that. And that's all we do have time for. So um, from me, Adrian Weckler, uh, you've been listening to The Big Tech Show. Thanks to Tabitha Monaghan, who produced to Gavin Hennessy on sound and to Conan Doherty on video. We will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.